Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Lisa Bordetsky williams author of the novel Forget Russia. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Hi, glad to be here. Sure. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, Forget Russia, how would you describe the novel? Great question. Well, Forget Russia, it's a historical novel, and it deals with three generations of Russian Jews traveling back and forth from America to the Soviet Union, and sometimes it's Russia, during the course of the 20th century. And it really looks at that nature of journey because each journey is about self-transformation and uh, the, the nature of journey and the, the nature of leaving one's home and always longing for it. So I think my novel, you know, sp speaks to that very specifically, the, that experience of where anyone comes from. They, 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 they long to return in some way, whether it's three generations ago, one generation, or they themselves, you know, have, have come. And it looks at the idea of inherited violence. What do hate crimes do across the generations, particularly in my novel, I look at women. Um, and hate crimes is such a big problem right now. Um, that my novel really addresses the absolute destruction and the um, how it it changes the lives of the of not just the um, immediate uh, victim, but of the lives of those who come afterwards. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing Forget Russia? Sure, sure. I I spent. Um, you know, over 10 years researching the novel. And it's really, in a sense, it's kind of like my life's work. I had this very unusual experience in 1980. Um, I was able to be a student. I was a Russian language and literature major in Moscow in 1980, in the height of the Cold War. And I met, in a sense, the grandchildren of the Bolsheviks leaders. Um, and they were young. Uh, many of them were Soviet Jews. Some were not Jewish. Um, and they couldn't get out. Um, and they were suffering from a lot of persecution there. And as an American, I'd really never witnessed that before. I went to the Soviet Union feeling like, oh, all this like negativity about it. Um, you know, I don't want to get swayed by it. But what I learned from being there, one, was this it, you know, incredible heroism and courage of the people I met. And also, you know, my grandparents had left and they even, they actually returned. They, one left before the revolution, one left after. They actually returned in 1931 to build the revolution. Um, and it was in the height of the depression here. And then they came all the way back here. So these multiple, multiple, multiple journeys that I'm exploring. But somehow I was looking at the nature of destiny that somehow you know, their grandparents had stayed and many of them had been murdered by Stalin or exiled in, in gulags. Um, and then somehow my grandparents had stayed. And, you know, we were really, it was a very amazing meeting um, of, of us. Um, there's an, I just want to, I think, sums up by this quote by this uh, Ludmila Ulitska who's a contemporary uh, Russian writer. And she says, it's fascinating to trace the trajectories of people destined to meet. And that's the way I felt. And in a sense, I really spent many, many years um, trying to distill this experience. Um, my own um, great grandmother was raped and murdered in a pogrom in in Russia, um, and to try and distill th this this incredible multi generational experience. And I chose a novel form to do so. Well, what kind of research did you do while you were writing your novel, Forget Russia? Well. You know, I knew the outline of the story. Of course, I'm really glad in terms of the Moscow sections, um, it's very much based on my experiences there. Um, but my um, great grandmother, Zlata, um, she was in the Ukraine um, in a, and my grandmother, Sarah, they were in a, a small shtetl called Gorna Stipal. And I had to really research that one, the history of the Ukraine. So the actually the civil war after the Bolshevik revolution, there was a civil war. Um, there, the white armies and 
uh, Ukrainian nationalists, they, they wanted the Bolsheviks out. And for a time, the these different factions that were warring with each other, but all united against the Bolsheviks, they were also all united that they hated the Jews. They took control of the Ukraine. Finally, in 1921, the Bolsheviks were able to reestablish control of the Ukraine. So that was a lot of research. And what happened was the defeated armies blamed the Jews and they went into these shtetls and they just, you know, massacred and murdered people. Um, and that was when my great grandmother Zlata, you know, lost her life in a very brutal way. My, my grandmother Sarah had already been deserted by her father. Um, before the revolution, he came to America, said he'd send for them and never did. In fact, he sent a letter of divorce. So, you know, she takes that first journey uh, uh, as a as a motherless uh, and almost orphaned uh, young woman at, at, at age 16. She's not even a young woman. She's still a girl because um, her uncle had located her father and she comes all the way to America. So I did a lot of research into the Ukraine. And the other thing I did a lot of research, I think the most unusual part of my novel is the story of those American Jews and other Americans who went to the Soviet Union in 1931, in the height of the Depression, in the 19, early 1930s, to build the revolution. And I did an enormous amount of research into that, you know, where they would have lived, what it was like. And, you know, when they first got there, they were really welcomed. There was even an American baseball team that was established. And I think it could have been very exciting as a young person. I, I mean, it was the living conditions were not easy, but, you know, people were so idealistic. But, you know, if you didn't leave by about 1936, 1937, you there's a good chance you were not going to get out of there and you were going to get stuck there. And uh, it could many, um, at least 200 black Americans went to the Soviet Union to escape American racism. And, um, you know, there was one story I read about a Mr. Robinson who uh, came, that uh, Ford Motors had a, had a plant in the Soviet Union. He was from Detroit. He could make more money. Uh, at Ford, he was just, you know, wanted to get away from American racism. But then they, the people in the factory, they, they like elected him to be um, some kind of official, which he didn't even ask for. And the American government revoked his citizenship. It took him about 50 years to get back into the country. Um, so, but a, a lot of people couldn't get out because the purges of 1936 to 38, the height of them, that Stalin just terrorized the country. And all of a sudden, if you had any foreign connection, you were now very suspect and in trouble. So um, in a sense, my, my family was very lucky that they left. Um, my, it was my grandmother, my, my, my grandfather, and they, they, this is based on family history. My, my mother, who was five, and my aunt, who was three. Um, it's kind of amazing. They took them all the way to the Soviet Union in 1931 and then came Whoa. all the way back nine months later because they would have lost their citizenship, U.S. citizenship as well and never gotten out of there. So it really looked at that kind of intense nature of journey. Sure. And you talked about this being a multi-generational novel. What was your writing process when you were working on it? Did you outline extensively? I did a lot of writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and retyping <laughs> the manuscript and retyping the manuscript. And I think it was very ambitious. And I took a lot of workshops and I was in a writing group. So it took me a long time. Um, it actually originally started as, an, as a memoir a long, long time ago. And I, as I researched more and more, I really wanted to um, capture that kind of multi-generational and I didn't know the details, obviously, of what happened in the Ukraine or what happened in 1931 in terms of my own family. So it was better to do the research and write it um, as a novel because there are also different fictional kind of techniques I use to link all these stories together without giving it away. Um, but I, I worked on it for a very long time. I mean... Um, <laughs> Certainly the last 15 years I worked on it, you know, I also teach full time, which I love at Ramapo College of New Jersey. So sometimes I'd like wake up at five in the morning and um, the summers. Um, I do think I realized I had to work on it every day, even if I couldn't devote 
lots and lots of time because if I skipped a day, it seemed like I would lose three days. It would take me three more days to get back into the kind of fictional world that I had entered. Well, well, given that experience that you just described of of taking workshops and writing and rewriting and and finally um, finishing and polishing your novel, what what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Okay, great question. I would say one, you know, write every day, even if you're like there's some days that you're just so busy, even just a little bit, just read it over and just add something to it. So the next day when you have more time, you don't lose all that time getting back into it. It'll just keep it going and just keep persevering because I wrote it so many, so many times. And I think that is the process actually. And it just takes a lot of reworking it and retyping it out and just, just trying different things and just keep persevering at it. Um, don't give up on it. Were, were there, um, were there writers or other novels that kind of inspired you as you were working on Forget Russia? Sure. Um, well, first of all, Julius Lester, um, who taught at the University of Massachusetts, uh, who has written many, many books, um, unfortunately he passed away a few years ago, was a tremendous mentor to me, um, from way back, um, I think his encouragement to me as a writer stayed with me my entire life. And then I had the unbelievable experience of studying with this wonderful um, Jewish woman's writer. She published under the name of E.M. Broner, Esther Broner. Mm -hmm. And she, I actually started the manuscript in her workshop. And then she invited me. I was very, very young and I was like in my twenties. So, I mean, I put the manuscript away for many years, but she really encouraged me and invited me to, actually come to Sarah Lawrence and just, um, you know, sit, sit in on her workshop there so I could get even more feedback from her. Um, there are just, you know, many, many books inspired me. I have to say, I really think the novel Dr. Shivago, that kind of epic love, mm-hmm. you know, there is a love story in the novel. Um, and I think all Novels about Russia probably could use a love story. Um, but that, that novel, Dr. Shivago, just that the epic where you're, you're in the revolution and then, you know, the snow and the countryside and the poetry that Pasternak you know, includes in that book. And just you feel like there's history and then there's people caught in history. And then there's this amazing love story that has got so much passion, but so much also obstacles. Um, so I, that's a book I just, you know, love so dearly. Um, and the poetry of Mayakovsky, um, poetry of Akhmatova, those are all tremendous influences on me. Well, in terms of Russia and specifically, I guess, politics, um, and just kind of the, the, uh, the history of the country. I mean, as you've talked about, you wrote your novel based on uh, your own family's experiences of going back and forth from the U S to, to Russia. And I'm curious now we have, um, you know, we Putin, Putin is in control. And as you know, there, you know, have been a number of assassinations and poisonings of, of, um, opposition leaders. I'm just curious, are we just looking at Russia from, from a, uh, American viewpoint, or, or will will there ever be a, a situation where there's true democracy there? Let's hope there will be. I mean, obviously, Putin is a dictator. He was head mm-hmm. of the KGB. Um, he allows no dissent. What's happening to Navalny is just criminal. But, I mean, I think we have to hope that, sure. you know, things will change. Um but yeah, I mean, it's uh, certainly there is no democracy there under him, and he's he's a bad guy. <laughs> right, no doubt right. About it. <laughs> um, you know, um, but I I think in calling the novel "Forget Russia," I mean the c- culture and the literature and the poetry and the music of Russia. I mean, I felt like my grandparents, you know, my 
never really could forget it. And even mm-hmm. my grandmother, who had a, such a uh, lost her mother in in this brutal way, um, when she was old and blind, um, she really spent her days actually singing Russian love songs to herself to just kind of keep her keep her alert. And that was where she returned to. And I thought that was what was really incredible. And I felt like the people I met were so amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the novel starts off with uh, the first line of it is, your problem is you have a Russian soul. You know, Anna's mother tells her that as she's, a, she, Anna's thinking about that as she's boarding the plane, she's terrified. She's all of 20, 22 or 23. She's never left the country before. Um, but that, what is that Russian soul? I remember, um, you know, when I went there, people would ask, you know, what would you live for? What would you die for? You know, it was just, and also the people I met, I mean, even though, I mean, they were kind of dissident types. Um, some of them were refuseniks, meaning they had applied to leave and then they lost their jobs. They um, just, they were very punished. And then they, they mm-hmm. get refused. So they couldn't leave. Um, some of them had, their parents had secret jobs, which probably meant they worked for the military, so they never thought they could get out. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, they also asked me things like, do Americans talk about anything other than business? <laughs> and, you know, they had a, a kind of a sense of Americans being a bit shallow. And I, I remember uh, we were, I teach an international poetry class and um, we were reading uh, Mayakovsky and I was kind of sharing that experience with my students. And one wonderful student just raised her hand and she said, well, it's kind of true, isn't it? <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> you know, um, but the, the, the kind of depth of, I felt like the people I met, like, you know, we, we had bonds that would last forever. And, sure. um, and I think that, you know, it really looks at that. Um, the other thing that the, the novel looks at is, you know, my, my, yes, my grandmother lost her, m- mother and she suffered from depression most of her life which you know is understandable but my grandfather also had a parent murdered um in a hate crime and it was uh in before 1908 and they owned a tavern and his father um was walking in the woods and he was robbed and he was murdered and it was the murdered part you know, seems to be because he was jewish but my grandfather wasn't traumatized and scarred the way my grandmother was. And it looks at the nature of that. He had a lot of brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was much more alone. Um, And in a, you know, in a certain sense, you know, it looks at all these kind of complex questions of why do people respond differently? And I think, you know, Anna, my character is going back there to somehow um, connect to these ancestors to figure out our own self-identity. Well, what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Um, well, actually, I'm staring at George Saunders' A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, which is such an incredible book. And actually, he, t- he takes these 19th century Russian short stories by Chekhov and Tolstoy and he analyzes them because he's such an he's an amazing short story writer and novelist. And he says these stories taught him how to write. And he takes the whole story apart and shows, you know, why they're perfect. So I've really been enjoying that a lot. Um, and I just, you know, finished Plunder um, by Menachem Kaiser um, about his uh, journey back to Poland to reclaim property that had been taken away during the Holocaust. Um, uh, I finished Cast by Isabel Wilkinson, which was such an incredible book. And um, I, I, I think it's really incredible. The I didn't know uh, until I read her book mm-hmm. she, where she documents how the Nazi leaders really looked to American slavery and the uh, Jim Crow laws to get inspired to build their own genocidal system. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a pretty incredible book. Yeah. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novel, Forget Russia? Sure. Um, my website is www.forgetrussia.com. And you can even email me at uh, forgetrussia at gmail.com. 
So I'm really easy to find. The book is everywhere on Amazon, Bookshop, Barnes & Noble, Powell's. It's, it's pretty much, you know, everywhere. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Lisa Bordetsky-Williams, author of the new novel, Forget Russia. The book is on sale now, as she just explained. So go buy a copy. And Lisa, thanks for doing this interview. Okay, great. Great.